Hi everyone, good afternoon. Buenas tardes, todos y todas. Um, we're going to get started. So as we settle in, and as you all have already been doing, please post a hello in the chat and let us know where you're coming from, your preferred pronouns, and any organizational affiliations that you have. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us for a discussion about envisioning an internationalist Green New Deal. This is the seventh and the last teach-in of the People's Green New Deal series. My name is Lala Peñaranda, and I'm a member of Science for the People. I'm based in uh, New York City, um, which is Lenapa land, and I want us to um, take a moment. I invite you to join me in acknowledging the heritage of the land from which you join us today, whether it is a settler colonial state, such as the United States, Australia, or Israel, uh, a former colony, such as the UK, France, or Spain, a formerly colonized state, such as Brazil, Nigeria, or India. We recognize that colonization in new forms and the devastating extractivism that often accompanies it continues today. We hope that today's teaching will contribute to the global struggle to end all of these forms of exploitation and oppression. And I want to give a few introductory notes before we jump into the teaching today. Uh, this teaching series is has been made possible through the efforts of folks from the editorial collective of the most recent edition of Science for the People magazine uh, called A People's Green New Deal. It's volume uh, 23, number two, and the Climate Change uh, Working Group of Science for the People. If you are interested in access to this magazine issue, getting more involved with Science for the People activities, the editorial collective for a future issue of the magazine, or the Climate Change Working Group, please, please, please uh, see the chat for the links. There are also links in the chat to subscribe to Science for the People magazine and sign up for a special order of a print copy for, People's Green, for the People's Green New Deal issue. Um, this teach-in series is endorsed by the Democratic Socialists of America, DSA, and the DSA Nationwide Eco-Socialist Working Group. DSA is the largest socialist organization in the U.S. with 85,000 members across the nation and growing. Uh, we encourage you, of course, to check out their work and join the movement if you can. This teaching is also, ex we're very excited about this, endorsed by the Natural History Museum. The museum inquires into what we see, how we see, and what remains excluded from our scene. If everyone could just mute their mics, please. It invites visitors to take the perspective of museum anthropologists attuned to the social and political forces inseparable from the natural world. Um, that falls very in line with uh, science with people's own work. In this teaching series, we have been engaging with magazine contributors as well as other thinkers and activists on wide ranging issues intersecting with the Green New Deal, covering everything from labor to energy democracy, agroecology, art and design, as well as looking first today at international and indigenous perspectives. Past teachings have been recorded and archived on our publishing YouTube channel and website. Finally, as we wrap up our teachings, we hope you will continue to be involved with Science for the People and our climate change working group. Um, we look forward to building a better future together. Please do get involved. Um, and today, now kicking off um, this closing panel, this closing teaching, uh, we have five excellent panelists. Our discussion will be focusing on why any Green New Deal proposal must be both international in scope and internationalist in vision. I'll introduce the panelists first and then give each five minutes to answer a question focused specifically on their line of work. Then we'll open up the discussion to the whole panel with a series of general questions. Um, and then we'll have about half an hour left, uh, hopefully, for audience Q&A. And then finally, at the end, I'll invite each of the speakers to give a brief closing statement um, of key lessons to, to take home. 
Okay, and with that, we'll get started. Um, Max Akil is an associated researcher with the Tunisian Observatory for Food Sovereignty and the Environment and a postdoctoral fellow with the Rural Sociology Group at Wageningen University. He writes on the place of the countryside in global development and researches Tunisian national liberation planning and political economy and Arab dependency theory and agrarian issues. His forthcoming book is A People's Green New Deal. And among his recent articles are Does the Arab Region Have an Agrarian Question? And The Hidden Legacy of Samir Amin, Delinking, uh, Delinking's Ecological Foundation. So welcome, Max. Um, our second brilliant panelist is Sergio Belda. He's a lecturer and researcher in the Faculty of Economics at the University of Valencia. He has academic and activist experience in the fields of transformative consumption and bottom-up organizations for eco-social transitions. He has played an active part in local social movements in Valencia in, over the past 15 years, particularly regarding food sovereignty and the right to the city. Then we have uh, Thea Rio Francos. She is an assistant professor of political science at Providence College, an Andrew Carnegie Fellow, uh, 2020 to 2022, and a Radcliffe Institute Fellow. Her research focuses on resource extraction, renewable energy, climate change, green technology, and social movements, and the left in Latin America. These themes are explored in her book, Resource Radicals, From Petronationalism to Post-Extractivism in Ecuador. And um, her co-authored book, A Planet to Win, Why We Need a Green New Deal. She is also a member of DSA and serves as a steering committee of the organization's eco-socialist working group. Brian Ward is an educator, socialist, and activist who lives in Madison, Wisconsin, occupied Ho-Chunk land, and has lived and worked on Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, home of the Oglala Lakota Nation. He is a member of the Red Nation Great Lakes and People's Green New Deal Madison. He contributed to the book 101 Changemakers, Rebels and Radicals Who Changed U.S. History, and his writings has appeared, have appeared in The Nation, Truth Out, New Politics, Science for the People, um, and more. And then finally, we have Jennifer Tang. She has an MA in European Culture, Society, and Politics from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. Her thesis, Shell, Make the Future, and the Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves in Nigeria, How a Fossil Fuel Corporation Obstructs Climate Justice Through Climate Action yeah. Denial explored how Royal Dutch Shell and its allies manufacture a false dichotomy between energy access and climate action to lock in decades of fossil fuel dependence and delay Nigeria's just transition to renewable energy. Um, she currently organizes with Solidarity and Mutual Aid Jersey City and the International Coalition for Human Rights in the Philippines. So those are those are long bios, but um, we're really we're really keen on um, getting their perspectives specifically on their line of work. We're also pleased to be offering simultaneous translation of today's event into Spanish, provided by David Costalago of Science for the People's Translation Working Group. To access uh, the Spanish translation, please check the the chat. Um, and let's go ahead and get started. So these are initial prompts um, for specific panelists. And we're going to start with Max. Um, Max, the first question we have for you is, how should agriculture figure in an internationalist Green New Deal? Welcome, Max. Sorry, I was started. Um, Yes. So thank you so much to the organizers and everyone behind logistics. I know it's a lot of work and uh, I think it, I look forward to, to learning from my co-panelists as well. So when we discuss transformations in agriculture as part of a Green New Deal, we're speaking of two interconnected aspects, social and political on the one hand and technical, ecological on the other. These are, of course, of course, intertwined. 
The technical and ecological aspects of what should be done are in fact very clear. Industrial agriculture, north and south, is an ecological and of course a social catastrophe. It is good only at one thing, which is producing a lot of food and other industrial inputs. If you go, for example, to the Project Drawdown website, most of what they suggest for what's called natural carbon drawdown reduces to taking good care of the soil. Soil which is treated properly absorbs carbon dioxide. And most estimates are that in large part because of industrial agriculture, CO2 is vastly depleted in the soil. So agroforestry, adaptive grazing, no-till agriculture, terracing, water retention dams, polycultures, long-term appropriate rotations, these bring soil back to life and bring carbon back into the soil. These measures have other effects, which are critical for the survival of the poor in the third world especially. They make plots, agricultural plots, more resilient to hurricanes, storms, and also drought. These are all things that we can call agroecology. So why isn't everyone doing agroecology? Well, agroecology is not merely ecological. It is political and social. It is attention intensive and maybe more labor intensive. But fundamentally, agroecological transformation in the South and in the North requires large scale agrarian reform. That is, there needs to be agrarian revolutions in the North and the South alongside pricing systems for agricultural goods which reject capitalist pricing and the law of value and internalize ecological costs and make sure people are paid fairly for their labor. Those two measures would essentially eliminate capitalist agriculture as we know it North and South. So how do we get there? What is the problem? What are the obstacles? We are, or rather our government is. Essentially, it would be close to accurate to interpret post-1945 U.S. foreign policy as a war against land to the small tiller agrarian reform. What the U.S. rejects and has rejected is the use of land to serve the, each country's poor and also to reject sovereign industrialization. That rejection is not merely through so-called objective economic laws. It occurs politically through campaigns of demonization, destabilization, destabilization and destruction, and it uses implements like sanctions, proxy wars, and direct wars once and while a target is demonized. That does not merely mean the U.S. seeks to prevent agrarian reform. Once that goal is achieved, which it largely has in the current moment, the U.S. seeks further goals, erasure of natural resource sovereignty, or for example, in the Arab region, the entire erasure of states and the leveling or destruction of productive forces like factories and hospitals. Unfortunately, there is not widespread support for embracing the burden of transformation, which we can carry on here. The intellectual agenda far too often capitulates or mimics government campaigns of demonization of Southern governments, which represent any form of strategic obstacle to U.S. strategic goals. What that means also is that what is needed here in the U.S., is to create political space for other countries to do what they need to do, which means putting national sovereignty and defending national sovereignty, which means at the top of the left's agenda. And that in turn creates the space for socio-ecological revolution abroad and at home, including through decolonization. Focusing on national sovereignty means acting from where we are, which is the best form of solidarity, and is the only way to open the doorway to a better future. Thank you. Thanks, Max. Um, we also had a teach-in specifically on agriculture, so I encourage everyone to, to look at that, although it was more in a US context. Um, and now we're going to go to Brian. Uh, Brian, welcome. The prompt question we have for you is, what would it look like to place decolonization at the center of an internationalist Green New Deal. Awesome, thank you so much. And um, I really want to 
say no like max said thank you to all the organizers that put this together and the translators who are translating currently into spanish uh for other listeners and um and all these people that are here um so i guess as full disclosure um at first um i personally am not indigenous uh um and i am indebted to so many indigenous comrades and friends that i organize with and organize um around indigenous liberation who have educated me on these issues. Um, and I, and I, I preface that just to show that indigenous liberation is for everyone. <laughs> um, so first off, I think we need to kind of pull apart what does decolonization mean? Um, this is a word that has been thrown around a lot. In fact, um, I saw a headline the other day that said decolonize the World Bank and IMF, uh, which made me laugh pretty hard. <laughs> and also, I even heard decolonize wealth and decolonize Thanksgiving. Um, it, it oftentimes seems like it's being watered down. But I, what, what I, when I hear decolonization from my perspective, um, that means disentangling the relationships that we have developed under capitalism and settler colonialism in North America, other, otherwise known as Turtle Island. We, have, we need folks to first accept that the U.S. is a settler a colonial state and was built on the stolen land and stolen labor. And we must also understand that this process has not ended and needs to be um, disentangled. Um, so... Uh, take a couple steps back in understanding that capitalism and settler colonialism kind of in its efforts to take land was vital. It was vital to separate people from the whole living world, you know, land, animals, and plants. Uh, the attempted removal of indigenous people was intentional because of their knowledge and connection to their homeland that threatened the very project. You know, capitalism needs to make land and the entire world a commodity in order to exploit it for profit. So in order to do this, the relationships to the non-human world had to be removed. And the only relationships that were acceptable were humans with commodities. And the idea that so many indigenous nations look seven generations ahead to influence their actions today is fundamentally contradictory to the idea of short-term profits, which is the ultimate goal of capitalism. So with that being said, in an effort to really center decolonization in a Green New Deal, um, it's vital to actually look carefully at land back campaigns. This has become a hashtag that has become very popular of late. Uh, but what that actually means is giving land back to indigenous nations and having them at the table. Um, and, it, and it's not just simply saying the word decolonization. Um, and it's important to be specific. Um, this has happened before. Uh, the Taos Pueblo uh, um, fought to get the Taos Lake back in 1972. Um, there was also the restoration of the Menominee uh, Nation in Wisconsin following the, uh, um, uh, the uh, termination. Uh, there's been the struggle in the Black Hills, also known as Hesapa, uh, back to the Asheti Shakoi or the Lakota, um, which the Supreme Court in 1980 um, said, yep, you, the United States owes them money, but they've said, no, we want the land. Um, and just yesterday, the Leech Lake Restoration Act, um, which passed Congress, is now going to the president's desk that um, directs the Chippewa National Forest in northern Minnesota to transfer over 11,000 acres uh, of Forest Service land to, um, to the uh, lake, uh, Leech Lake uh, Band of the Ojibwe. And so, it's important for us to think about that and to also think cl closely that the idea of land back is hard for non-natives to understand because colonization has extended its tentacles into our minds as ideas that drive colonization. Non-natives will often say, well, if we give land back, they will do uh, exactly what we did to them. And this is a colonized mindset, you know, centering Indigenous liberation and decolonization in the Green New Deal is about changing our relationship to land and labor to, uh, and ultimately changing the profit system. 
And the Green New Deal states we need to protect uh, uh, um, indigenous nations and communities. But we need to actually look beyond protecting. Um, so I'm part of the Red Nation, which has um, written the Red Deal, um, which was put forward by the Red Nation and is a complementary plan to the Green New Deal. But I would say really focuses on centering indigenous liberation. Um, in the Red Deal, in addition to centering land back, it calls for the U.S. to fulfill on treaty obligations, all which have been broken and some though are but are used as a legal framework to exercise rights, ensure tribal sovereignty and, reinst and actually reinstating treaty making as a component to, uh, to an ecological future. As indigenous knowledge and practices have shown us that the original caretakers of the land bring a different perspective uh, to the land. Um, as they see the earth as a relative. Um, and indigenous people have been on the front lines of these extractive policies, and we've seen the uh, use uh, of, of treaties as well as uh, in struggle in the struggles um, at Standing Rock against the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, line five, which was just is in the process of being decommissioned, which is through uh, um, through Wisconsin in uh, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, um, and line three, which has right now just uh, gone over some other hurdles, um, and are um, there's going to be continued resistance of a multiracial fight of indigenous and non-indigenous, um, and throughout you no know, Canada as well. These are fights that are active and and sent Centering decolonization is ensuring that those rights are upheld, as well as looking beyond and calling for land back. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brian. Um, and again, we had a, recently a teaching just on indigenous knowledge and decolonization, so we encourage you to look at that one as well. Um, next, we have Jenny. Uh, welcome, Jenny. The question for you is, what challenge do multinational fossil fuel companies pose to an internationalist Green New Deal? Sure. Uh, thank you, Lala. And uh, first, I'd like to give a shout out to DSA, Science for the People, and the translators for organizing this. And shout out to my homies who are tuning in. You're amazing and you inspire me. So multinational uh, fossil fuel companies, they're an obstacle to international solidarity. Fossil fuels are literally unsustainable and they need to stay in the ground. The problem is that fossil fuel companies are in the business of protecting their current and future investments. They're capitalists. Um, and it's not just fossil fuel companies that stand to profit from climate change and fossil fuels. It's the whole financial system, the banks that fund them, the pensions that rely on their profitability. It's the military industrial complex that literally runs on fossil fuels. The U.S. military is the world's largest institutional consumer of fossil fuels, and the U.S. spends more than half of its federal discretionary budget on its military, which then goes and destabilizes other countries in the global south who dare to stand up to their oppressors. Fossil fuel companies are an obstacle to an internationalist Green New Deal because they rely on state-sanctioned violence through war and also against organizers and land defenders. They enforce a scarcity of resources and especially of renewable alternatives. But these days, fossil fuel companies can no longer outright just deny that climate change is real. In recent times, they've acted like they're part of the solution, when in reality, they are the problem. They've co-opted concern about the environment to prove that they're with the times, but they justify their further fossil fuel exploitation by saying that the countries that they're exploiting deserve access to these fossil fuels, too. As an example, which I explored in my article, Shell has its hashtag make the future campaign, a glossy way to greenwash its inherently unsustainable business practices. In Nigeria, Shell is trying to market liquefied petroleum gas, LPG cookstoves, as a form of clean cooking. And these cookstoves, of course, will generate offsets. So they're green, but they're not actually green because they run on fossil fuels. They're trying to market LP gas cookstoves as a way to end gas flaring and help the environment. 
and they've even written these stoves into Nigeria's renewable energy policy. And it positions Shell as the solution to a problem that they directly caused. It erases the violence that Shell enacted on the people of Nigeria, starting from when it acted under the authority of British colonial rule in the 1950s. The reason why Nigerians lack access to electricity and cooking gas in the first place is because the gas that could have powered this infrastructure was instead flared, literally set on fire, rather than refined to provide these resources to people. This was a deliberate decision made by Shell starting in the 1950s to flare the gas to the detriment of local communities, poisoning these people and their land, air, and water. Which is, and Shell has continued to do this in violation of national and international law for decades. They chose to do this because it would be more cost effective. The final consumer of the crude oil lived in Europe. So Shell chose to keep prices low by ignoring the human and ecological costs of their decisions. Shell's greenwashing also erases the violence that Shell perpetrated in the 1990s when it paid the Nigerian state police to violently suppress protesters in the Niger Delta in Agoniland, who were sick from decades of gas flaring and oil spills and bravely disrupted access to oil wells while and the laying of a pipeline. Thousands of people, including the leaders of this movement, were killed or displaced by state police who were paid by Shell. So to summarize, fossil fuel companies limit our imagination of what is possible because they rely on maintaining poverty and scarcity, and they have the military, police, and other state security forces at their disposal to violently suppress anyone who dares to imagine a better world for themselves and their children. You see this in the U.S. as well, with Standing Rock and all of the money that fossil fuel companies donate to police foundations. Of course, the issue of exploitation and state violence is not limited to fossil fuel corporations. Even allegedly green corporations like Tesla rely on uh, and support state-sanctioned violence, whether in the form of labor violations, collaborating with the military, or an attempted coup in Bolivia. Thank you so much, Jenny. And next we have Thea. Uh, Thea, the question that we have for you is what components of an internationalist Green New Deal could increase extractivism in the global south? Welcome. Thank you. Um, and I'm just so thrilled to see so many comrades, friends, people that I don't know yet um, in the audience um, and just for a very generative conversation so far. And thanks again to the translators. I'll try to remember to speak slowly for that. Um, so as as Jenny mentioned at the outset of, of her comments, and I think as the accelerating climate emergency makes abundantly clear, we need to keep fossil fuels in the ground. Um, and this is the transition to renewable energy. Um, but the problem, immediate problem that I'm going to get into is that the green technologies, so-called, such as solar panels, wind turbines, lithium batteries, and electric vehicles that a transition to renewable energy require, um, themselves require intensified and also new forms of resource extraction. And of particular concern, and my focus today, is the quantity of mining that is, the quantity of mining specifically that is required to manufacture these technologies. Um, so as many are surely aware um, among the audience and, and of my fellow panelists, mining is a, is a major source of socio-environmental harm in the global south. It is also a site of inspiring radical anti-capitalist and anti-extractivist politics, which we'll get into maybe a bit later. But for now, I'm going to focus on the harm side of the equation. Um, so why is mining a source of harm? It has an enormous land footprint, which results in territorial dispossession of indigenous, Afro-descendant, and mestizo communities um, throughout Latin America and in the global south. I'll focus more on Latin America today. Um, in, in some cases, displacing entire communities. It causes soil and water contamination, threatens pre-existing or alternative non-extractive livelihoods, and it often occurs without any form of substantive prior consent or even consultation. 
Um, and in addition, there's a long history, and Jenny alluded to it or, or commented on it directly, of states and corporations deploying repressive force to protect mining projects. She discussed this in terms of oil, but the same is true in terms of mining. Um, in particular, I'll note that Latin America has been called the most violent place in the world for land and water defenders in terms of how many people are assassinated by um corporations, paramilitary organizations, states, you know, various forms of repressive forces um, uh, with often U.S. or global north complicity, as has already been mentioned. Um, and I'll say right away that because of the fact that uh, green technologies such as the ones that I mentioned require a substantial amount of mining, uh, they a, a renewable energy transition threatens to entrench the status quo of what we can call unequal ecological exchange in which the global South plays the socio-ecological costs for global capital accumulation. So I just want to very quickly zoom in on electric vehicles. That's what I've been focusing on in my, in my research and give you a sense of their ecological, the ecological and social harm that, that they, that their supply chains entail. Um, and I also want to note, um, and you're all probably familiar with this, that electric vehicles have been presented as like a solution or technological kind of fix for climate change. And so I think we need to think critically as that position becomes increasingly hegemonic. Um, such vehicles can contain up to 200 pounds of copper wiring. Um, and so you can think of how many open pit copper mines in the world that would require to supply. Their batteries require graphite, cobalt, nickel, lithium, and more. Um, I'll also note that these same batteries are needed not just for electric vehicles, but also for renewable grids, um, which are needed to store intermittent wind and solar energy. So I'm saying this because even in a world where we didn't reproduce like a car dependent culture and, um, you know, think of electric vehicles as a solution to climate change, some probably lithium and these other things would be needed to extract if we want to have renewable grids or renewable energy storage. And I think this poses some really thorny questions for the eco-socialist left. I'm just going to sort of put that aside there, but I, I wanted to mention it. Um, Chile is one of the world's top lithium producers. The two top producers are Chile and Australia. Um, it's extracted in Chile from the salt flats of the Atacama Desert. Um, this process has an extremely concerning impact on the water system of this desert, which is, by the way, the second driest place on Earth after Antarctica. Um, and the water system is, for that reason, uniquely um, vulnerable. Um, the 18 indigenous communities that live in the immediate zones of extraction have seen threats to their water access. They have noted that the water table is lower. They are less able to access water for agriculture or for other forms of daily consumption. And they have also been increasingly militant about the violations of their collective rights to prior consultation and consent, which have not been enforced. In addition um, to those threats, uh, workers that work at the lithium installations in the Atacama have faced very repressive union busting tactics by corporations that have close ties to the Chilean government. Um, and one of which actually comes out of the um, uh, was privatized during the Pinochet dictatorship, which was, uh, of course, supported by the CIA. So there's a long history here. Um, so this raises the question that the harms, the social and environmental harms um, of, of lithium extraction in Latin America raise the question of under what conditions could a global energy transition away from fossil fuels and to renewable sources be globally just? Um, I want to note um, here right away, and I think it, it sort of resonates with some themes that came up in Max's talk that maybe we'll expand on a little bit in the Q&A, but there are different I guess what I would consider sort of different radical or left responses in Chile itself and in Latin America broadly to the, the question of, of unequal ecological exchange and its, and its harms. Um, in Chile, there is, there are sort of two main strands on the left, um, the Chilean left. One is a, a resource nationalist stance, which wants national ownership of lithium extraction. And the other is an anti-extractivist stance, which is opposed to that nationalist stance and opposed to lithium extraction to courts. So um, I want to, you know, think through with sensitivity what this means for Global North solidarity. Um, I have thoughts, but, you know, I think that Max raised a good point that, like, first and foremost, we think through how to 
you know, tactically and strategically how to limit the intervention of governments in the global north and the global south. Um, but I still think that there's complexities in terms of different movements to be in solidarity with that are not always aligned with one another. And I just want to sort of put that out there. But regardless of 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 the politics, the sort of local and national politics of lithium extraction in Chile and, and in Latin America, I think that no matter what, the only way to a global on my uh, desk. The only way to a globally just energy transition would entail very deep transformations in the prevailing modes of production and consumption in the global north. So I think I'm echoing a little bit what Brian and also um, really what all the panelists have brought up, that like uh, an energy transition alone is far from sufficient. We need to think through how to totally transform the mode of production as well as upend um, and transform the power relations of a neocolonial world order. So I will leave it there um, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Thea. Yeah, I think in Science for the People, we think it's important to look at the sort of debates and complexities and matices that um, happen in each of these national and local contexts. Um, and yeah, I understand that the debates in the left, in the eco-socialist left, are um, are very dynamic um, and engaging with that reality. So um, finally, we have as uh, the closing prompt questions, um, we have a question for Sergio, um, which is given all that the panelists um, have said so far, how do local or localist solutions interact between them? Um, and uh, yes, and also local solutions. How do they interact between them? Welcome, Sergio. Okay, Nala, thank you so much. Thank you so much, people from Science for the People, for uh, creating such an uh, interesting uh, space and for, for the invitation. So let's speak uh, briefly about solutions. We spoke a lot about problems, <laughs> but uh, my previous uh, comrades already mentioned some things about solutions alternatives. So let's speak now a bit about how local solutions may interact between them and also with national at the international level. Well, we know, that's for sure, that we find like thousands of local solutions and movements already in place. You know that transition is something which is taking place already in the different territories all around the world. So we can say that it's a kind of well, invisible but real Green New Deal from below already taking place. We can say that. And we can say that considering these like uh, interactions between uh, these local solutions, local movements, local alternatives, they feel together somehow. Even if they do not know each other, we can say that all these local processes still have a sense of solidarity. I think that there is a kind of symbolic, cognitive, emotional uh, a, a, a connection between all these. You can find a very small uh, movement or organization or whatever in, uh, in, in Spain, and as long as this is committed with uh, the idea of transition, the idea of revolution, it's somehow connected with some of the movements in some of the places. Usually, we know that this sense of belonging is usually structured around different identities, different issues, and different political ideas. For example, around the issue or the idea or the concept or the discourse of agroecology, as Max mentioned, or food sovereignty, it was also mentioned, or around the issue of climate justice, or energy transition, or the growth, or whatever. So we find that maybe a very urban, urban uh, farmer in Argentina may feel as part of the same movement than a farmer in a farmer's cooperative in France, for example. And because they, 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 they are all, they're both connected to ecology, so they, they find like they share a, 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 a kind of political project. But, of course, solidarity and interactions are not only based in identity. We are not that postmodern, you know. Uh, is this also about the politics, and it's about also the politics of mobilization. I think that all these solutions are also connected because they are all uh, already setting a new way of doing things, a new way of doing things based on radical participation practices, on decentralized practices, on a focus on relocalization, a focus on the growth. And I think this makes easy for solutions to recognize them, even if they don't know them, between them, 
or once they meet them for the first time, they can really recognize them easily because they know that they are all trying to prefigure alternative futures. So we have these alternatives that are somehow connected in terms that they share a common ground. They share an idea of the conditions we need or the way we have to do things in order to, uh, to finally create uh, this uh, transition. And uh, regarding the connections between the local and the global, we can also say that uh, these uh, relations are, I think they are very complex and we find different kinds of processes. Some kind, some times we find national or international movements that emerge from the connection of local initiatives, but sometimes we also find the opposite. We find global initiatives that try to inspire, support, and encourage local, local initiatives from the bottom up. Uh, moreover, we find those uh, initiatives which are more formalized, or initiatives uh, or networks, international networks which are more formalized, and international networks which are more fluid, more informal, more uh, which change during time. Uh, we can find different examples. Maybe one very, very, very interesting example, one of the most known international social movements, La Via Campesina, I think you are all familiar with them, it's a clear example of an international movement, but you know it's an international movement that brings together millions in the end of peasants, small and medium-sized farmers, landless people, rural women, etc., and which uh, comprises more than uh, 180 organizations in 81 countries, in Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Americas, and which has a focus in food sovereignty. This global international movement was born from the bottom up, was born uh, with the connection of uh, initially from European and Latin American uh, organizations and has now developed a very structured and formal uh, uh, network of, 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 uh, of organizations, which was born again from the bottom up, but which now tries to also uh, encourage new organizations, new movements in the different territories. Then we have another kind of models. Let's put, for example, this very recent movement, Fridays for Future. It's somehow, somehow the opposite things. It's a movement built at the international level. It's very fluid, not very formal, but it's inspiring for local initiatives to born. It offers inspiration, it offers language, it offers tools for local communities to organize and to feel part of these movements. Maybe take the name of Fridays for Future and create their own campaigns. So, just to sum it up, uh, we have a uh, a huge number of initiatives uh, in the different territories. They feel that they are part of something bigger, I guess. And we have also, the, uh, we also know that there are different ways of connecting these initiatives. Somehow they emerge from the bottom up. Sometimes they are more international uh, um, uh, proposals, which then goes to the local and inspires local uh, local alternatives. But the key, I think. The key idea here is that all these models should, and I think they are, respecting and encouraging diversity and autonomy regarding local solutions. They are creating spaces for learning, spaces for demonstrating that different things can be done, and uh, not responding to the pressures of institutions. Institutions always try to make organizations organize, to have representatives, to have formal structures, but these movements are, uh, are uh, demonstrating that different ways of organizations are possible and that the key thing here is autonomy, diversity, learning, and exploring different pathways for social transformation. Thank you so much. And Gracias, Sergio. Thank you, Sergio. Um, okay, so that concludes the prompt round. Um, and we're going to go straight into the overarching questions for our panelists. We have three or four, depending on how we're doing with time. Um, and before we jump into the first one, I want to remind everyone to keep the comments and chats uh, and questions going in the chat. Uh, this is not a unilateral um, teaching. We are all teaching one another. So please, please keep that going. Um, I'm learning a lot. Share resources, share reports, share links. Um, and also, uh, Science for the People's Twitter handle is at sftporg if you want to um, share resources or quotes that you're pulling from uh, this teaching. So, 
We're going to start with a first overarching question of perspective, and um, I'm going to remind the panelists to keep your answer short, three three minutes approximately, um, and it can be a bit of popcorn. Um, and the first question is, what are the problems inherent in a Green New Deal proposal being written by and for nations in the global north? Who wants to answer that first? I'm going to just jump in because I think I can say something sh short, really short, less than three minutes, because um, I really want to hear what my comrades have to say on the panel. But I have some thoughts on this. Um, so I think that this the problem of perspective is maybe worse in the U.S. Uh, I don't you know, m there's many different bad actors in the global north, but I'm just going to speak to the legacy of American exceptionalism, which is like a particularly pervasive ideology in the U.S. that has its roots in federal colonialism. And Brian actually did a really good job, I think, of sort of extricating some of that that um, and how that inflects the present. Um, and so, you know, I think that there's just a particular tendency in the U.S. and it unfortunately marks the left as well to have like real limit blinders around like internationalism, what the world system is, like what the relations of power are. I don't want to make this like a transhistoric monolithic statement because there have been many moments in U.S. history, especially if we look at the, um, you know, the history of indigenous struggle, the history of, of the black power movement and the black freedom struggle, the history of Chicano struggle, like there are, and migrant justice. Like, of course, there are struggles that at various moments have connected to struggles around the world and have had a real internationalist vision, but that has been repressed by the state has been at times lost to history and also just I think is not internationalism is just not as vibrant on the U.S. left today as it as it should be. So I think that there's a real danger, particularly in the U.S., of like not even understanding the basics of how a Green New Deal relates elsewhere in the world. Like what would the implications be for the global south of a Green New Deal? Would they be good or bad? You know, just as a baseline, that question is rarely asked, except in places like this. I mean, I think Science for the People, um, the DSA Eco-Socialist Working Group has been good on that. You know, there are exceptions, but and, and Red Nation, of course. I mean, this has already been mentioned, but there are exceptions, and I don't want to paint too broad a brush, but I think there's a real lack of international knowledge, thinking, and relationships in the U.S. left. Um, and I just want to do a quick contrast, and then with this, I'm going to end it and hear what the other folks have to say which is one of the main differences for me um, for uh, com comparing the Green New Deal with um, some really inspiring proposals that are coming out of Latin America, particularly, and I'm, and I'm talking about the Pacto Eco Social, and I can put it in the chat if someone doesn't do it before me, which is a very interesting Green New Deal-like, but maybe in some ways more radical, you know, we could, you know, whatever, get into the weeds later, kind of proposal for socio-ecological transformation towards a society based on socio-ecological care, um, is that this, the Pacto Eco Social, this proposal coming out of Latin American social movements, really focuses on the international order. For example, it calls for the cancellation of sovereign debt which is just like not something that U.S. Green New Deal activists are thinking about. And in my opinion, sovereign debt is one of the main strangleholds that promotes extractivism in the global south, subordinate, political subordination of the global south, and limits the room, fiscal room for maneuver for like left wing governments in the global south to actually implement policies that would empower people you know, living in those countries. So just even to speak about debt and the Green New Deal in the same sentence is something that we just aren't doing that much in the U.S., but I think looking to proposals that come from elsewhere is is a really important corrective um, to that tendency. Yeah, that was great. Thanks, Thea. Who else wants to jump in on that first question? I could say a couple a couple comments. Um, so, like, just kind of going off that, I feel like the, uh, especially when we talk about American uh, exceptionalism and American imperialism, I think... Um, if how if the United States can't even like think through how to um, actually discuss its um, uh, settler colonial framework and how to challenge it. And that, I think that is it. I think it's starting to change on the left, but that is starting. Um, that is certainly a weakness of, of the left in the United States um, that uh, how can we then actually have even an internationalist view? Uh, and I, I think and it's important to think of indi indigenous nations 
as part of that international view, you know, nation to nation. Um, and I think that's really uh, um, a pivotal um, thing to consider. And I think um, when we discuss like the Green New Deal in the North, you know, one of the things I always I come to is I think about Elizabeth Warren, you know, progressive, oh, what have you. You know, we need to green the military, the military, like the the military, which is the U.S. military, one of the most uh, uh, the 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 points of which are one of the worst things for the environment is also one of the worst things for um, the rest of the world. And like actually uh, challenging that in the in the United States, the the settler state does not is not going to question that without social movement pressure. And so I think. Um, I think that's what, where it's problematic. And I think also if we just look through like regular politics where it, the U.S. always with that exceptionalism, that idea that the U.S. needs to lead, um, the U.S. needs to listen. <laughs> you know, like people are doing amazing things around the world um, and and the United States, uh, no surprise here, is behind because they're one of the drivers of trying to destroy the environment. And so um, I think that – us as a, a, a movement activist need to actually look beyond the American state uh, in order to influence the way that we um, that we uh, try to influence the American state. Thanks for that, Brian. Anyone else for that first question? Yeah. Yeah. Something going uh, on. Let's do Max first, and then Sergio. Okay. Yeah, so I think um, I'm very happy that uh, that uh, Thea raised this mention of debt and that Brian raised this question of uh, listening to people and listening to what other people are putting forward. Um, so I think if we if we look a little bit at the history of the global environmental justice movement, right, if you go back to 2009, 2010, 2011, the one of the central unifying demands uh, which emanated primarily from the global south, but was also entirely echoed by uh, eco-socialist activists in the global north, were the demands for the repayment of the climate debt as a component of the larger ecological debt. Um, one of those uh, planks or one of those uh, articulations came from Bolivia, which put forward a demand for 6% of northern GNP to go to the south. So that is about uh, 1.5 trillion in transfers direct uh, from the U.S., for example, uh, a year um, or, or more. I don't know the exact number. It's a huge amount. Um, and if uh, and so we're talking about revolutionary numbers, right? I mean, the total amount of U.S. foreign aid is is negligible. What's tragic is that climate debt is no longer on the table when it comes to most leftist spaces and the Green New Deal. And I think this is actually remarkably easy to, to remedy. And I would advise people first, you can go look up the Cochabamba uh, people's uh, process the, and the statements that came out of it and the calls for climate debt. It's a very pedagogical, transparent, activist oriented statement. Um, it's signed on by uh, more groups from the global south than I can possibly count. And it's very clear. They want to, uh, there's a demand from the south to the north to repay the colonial legacy and compensate people for the enclosure of cheap development paths because they can't use coal. The south cannot be using coal. And finally, to support them in their build, in their attempts to adapt to the disaster that is already coming their way, like in Central America, which is now devastated by northern induced climate change. I mean, that's the cause of the migration crisis. So it's very, um, you know, there, it can be, there's huge ways to, uh, there's endless um, details and nuances, and I think those are very important. But I think we can't let those uh, cloud out the most fundamental pillars of solidarity, which is actually acting in the fundamental demands, which are coming from Global South, which is the repayment of climate debt. And that should be on the coming from our mouths every time anyone anywhere is discussing the Green New Deal, because this is how we act in solidarity with the third world. Thanks, Matt. Sergio? Yes, uh, I wanted to add something which is very connected with these previous comments. And I think that the thing is that 
we see that this, uh, the, the, this question can be expanded and to, to think that the problems can be inherent to the fact that uh, Green New Deal proposals are written in the North, but also that there are a lot of problems inherent in the fact that the Green New Deal is written by the powerful, both in North and South, or that these uh, Green New Deal uh, questions are written by, uh, in a top-down process, North or South. Plus, even if another want to be very romantic regarding the nature or agenda of social movements or of organized workers, but I think that uh, if a Green New Deal is done or is essentially driven or proposed by social movements, by people in the end, by organized people uh, in the North or in the South, the interests will connect. The interests of the dispossessed in the North and the South are the same. We already know that. So I think that if the Green New Deal is proposed, is implemented, and if the protagonist of the Green New Deal is in the people, this uh, dichotomy between the North and the South may begin to fade. Oh, I think it, 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 it can take a different, a different position. So the question is, if this deal comes from the people, or if this deal comes from the powerful, north or south? Yeah, uh, absolutely, Sergio. Um, my daytime job is with trade unions for energy democracy, and I'm from Colombia. Um, and, you know, the trade union demands that we have in Colombia often butt heads with um, our, our ruling elite in Colombia. Um, so absolutely. Um, okay, so that, I believe, wraps up the first general question, and we're going to jump into the second. And again, uh, three minutes, please. Um, the second question is, what sorts of proposals similar to the Green New Deal have been made outside of the United States? How are such proposals viewed by the left in different regions of the world? Um, and... Who would like to uh, kick us off with that question? Brian, I nominate you. <laughs> oh man. Okay. Uh, I guess I'll go. Uh, so, it, I, so I'm going to no, know once again in this concept that I'm talking about when we say international, like thinking about indigenous nations as international as well. And I think that's important. I know I mentioned this in my opening comments, but the Red Deal, which isn't per se outside of the, you know, the borders of the United States, but has an international perspective. Um, and so this the Red Deal was you know, endorsed by the Democratic Socialists of America. Um, and um, was you know, written by the Red Nation and really uh, looks to go beyond the scope of the U.S. colonial state. Um, and I, I think what's really uh, – and I encourage everyone to read through it. It's a beautiful um, three-part document uh, broken into you – know, called End the Occupation, uh, Heal Our Bodies, and then Heal Our Planet. And I think one of the most interesting things that I appreciate about this document is the interconnectivity of not just when we're looking at the environment, but also looking at the systems that, that uh, are um, support the extractive industry, including like a demand to defund the police. Right. You no, know, we think about the uprisings this past um, summer and what we what we saw at Standing Rock, you know, it was police and what we see around the world is police are uh, are um, are always on the side of the extractive industries um, and you know connecting free healthcare to this idea and con um, connecting um, the decommodification of our our world and uh, one of the big things is centering for you know from an indigenous perspective treaty rights and re and uh, protecting uh, uh, sacred sites and you know issuing you know, a land back campaign which we are seeing more and more again i can't go into all the details of this but i highly encourage people 
to take time to actually read through these documents um, that I think actually expand what the the um, Green New Deal is. And I think it also falls in line with what, you know, Science for the People calls a people's Green New Deal. And from an international perspective and an indigenous perspective on Turtle Island. <laughs> Thank, sorry for putting you on the spot, Brian, but that was a great answer. <laughs> Who else wants to take a jab at this question? Hola. Sí, Sergio. <laughs> Gracias. Yeah, I would like to share this situation. Very briefly speak about the situation in Europe because it's, it's, it's interesting difference. I think that Green New Deal in the U.S. is well, sometimes, somehow connected with uh, progressive discourses, with progressive policies. But that's not the case in Europe. In Europe, you know that this has been a flag of the European Commission at least in the European Union, not in the whole Europe. But uh, this Green New Deal has been heavily uh, used by the European Commission as uh, yeah, a new flag for its politics. And we cannot, we cannot say that the European Commission is progressive in itself. In fact, it's more like a technocratic, top-down, pro-status quo institution, which in fact is, even if it has not a real democratic legitimacy, uh, it is more oriented to, to liberal policies per, per definition, let's say. So in Spain or in Europe, I think the Green New Deal has uh, this technocratic uh, top-down meaning still. Um, even though we have to say that this Green New Deal uh, discourse from the European Commission has opened so many opportunities for some more progressive policies. For example, it has despite some reforms in the energy sector, who has allowed it, at least in Spain, uh, or has made uh, more easy the self-production of energy, for example. Before in Spain, it was really difficult to self-produce energy. It was nearly forbidden because of the pressure of the energy lobby. But thanks to the European pressure, now laws in Spain have to change. So now it's becoming a bit more easy to, to build your own uh, production of energy. But in any case, uh, Green New Deal is connected with some policies regarding green transitions, which will be led in the following years, already led by big companies in the energy sector or other sector. And this is not particularly clear and particularly true in the new found regarding the post-COVID, uh, uh, for the post-COVID recovery policies. Now we have a huge amount of money which we put on the table, and a lot of this money has to be spent in green transition, and 99% of this money will be spent by big companies for doing their green transition and for their green new deal. So that's our sad situation, let's say. <laughs> that's it, Sergio. Anyone else for this question about initiatives outside of the United States? Um, and while someone jumps on that question, again, a reminder, our Twitter handle is at SFTPORG. So please um, share resources, share quotes. Um, and a reminder that um, all the links that are being shared in the chat will be sent out via email if you registered with your email for this talk. Um, and the, the email for the Climate Change Group of Science for the People has been posted in the chat. So if this is inspiring you to want to get involved with Science for the People, please send us an email, get involved. Um, and does anyone else want to jump on that question? I think Jenny does, and I can say something after her if there's time. Or awesome. Thanks, Thea. Jenny? Um, yeah, sure. So I can give a quick uh, rundown of a proposal in Nigeria. So in Nigeria, there uh Nigeria is Africa's largest oil producer, and oil is their top export. Um, and yet yeah, it's resource rich, but its people lack access to the very resources that are being exploited, which is really messed up. So um, there is an organization called ERA, uh, Environmental Rights Action. They're um, also known as Friends of the Earth Nigeria. And in 2018, they, they and their partners drafted a renewable energy bill, which they presented to the Nigerian National Assembly. So the ultimate goal of this is to create a shift away from 
an oil driven economy um, with its history of pollution, corruption and unequally distributed wealth and to develop democratically controlled renewables as part of a just transition that prioritizes green jobs. Um, so I can read just a few of the things that were proposed um, because it's really interesting that they and necessary that they articulated this. And uh, this just proves that, n no, like you don't need fossil fuels to develop and like, yeah, and fossil fuels create more like climate change will create more poverty anyway. So some things that were um, proposed in this bill are um, yeah, decentralized alter alternative energy with a focus on renewable energy. So like off and mini grids, um, zero tariffs on these renewable energy products. Um, and they want the Nigerian government and governments in Africa to prohibit the import of obsolete vehicles and machines, as well as a ban on generator sets. And that's like something that we all need to like think about is that a lot of like e-waste is sent to exploited countries and like it's the same with um, military machinery as well. And um, yeah, so it's like a lot of other things and something that I found interesting was they wanted uh, the World Bank, the Nigerian government and financial institutions to divest funding loans and subsidies for all fossil fuel investment. That's like, it's so basic, but it's, it's necessary and we need that. And another thing that they wanted to include was renewable energy to be taught as a course of study in all school curriculums. Um, yeah. And like, you need to teach this to students um, because it's their future. And also, of course, a polluters pay principle, uh, which is the bare minimum. And yet it's not <laughs> existent yet. Does anyone know about the UN's Green New Deal uh, published in 2009? Daniel, we have a bunch of questions that we're going to get to in just a minute. I'll let Thea answer um, that question, the, the question formally asked. Yeah, um, so so I, I'll just expand like a little bit on the facto eco social, which I already brought up and maybe say a word or two about like this current moment in Latin America and the and the sort of possibilities for a radical eco social transformation in the region. Um, so I mentioned before that the facto eco social is like a broad kind of set of demands um, that range from canceling debt to leaving fossil fuels in the ground to centering care um, as like a that as a principle, a social and ecological care is like a principle of how economies should be organized to like having direct income support in the form of UBI. So it's like a very, you know, as Jenny was listing some of those um, uh, uh, demands from Friends of the Earth Nigeria, like similarly, there are a lot of different demands contained in the Pacto Eco Social. I very much encourage folks to check it out. Um, but, um, you know, I think that there, there also needs to be a consideration of like the economic situation that Latin America finds itself in right now. One of those aspects I already mentioned and, and we've discussed quite a bit in the form of the debt as a sort of stranglehold on, on the region. I want to note that a few months ago, sort of early, earlier in the pandemic moment, um, a bunch of former Latin American leftist presidents and officials, um, came out in support of, of debt cancellation, um, including, uh, Rafael Correa and Bachelet and, you know, sort of center left to left kind of group of presidents said, former presidents um, said, we need to cancel the debt. And I think that, you know, change doesn't come from the top. Like, I don't imagine change coming because the global north is like, oh, we're going to be charitable and cancel the debt. Change will come from movements in Latin America and the global south demanding it and and hopefully um, coordinating across those countries and refusing to pay the debt in a kind of like Harkening back to um, the the proposals that were in the 1970s for a new international economic order, um, wherein countries in the global south or third world like came together and said like we want X, and and I, I just don't foresee change coming from the global north. Though I very much believe activists in the global north should press for it. That's not I'm not like erasing that. I'm just saying that it seems like if we believe that change comes from the exploited and the marginalized, like 
then then I, I would, you know, I hope that there are more coordinated initiatives across the global south to just refuse to pay that debt. And I just want to sort of put that idea out there and we'll see how that goes. And I'll lastly just say that, like, the economic devastation in Latin America um, from COVID is, I think, considered by economists to be the most extreme in the world. And that has to do with the structure of Latin American economies, how they're integrated into global markets, how they rely on trade of commodities that has been very depressed recently, and also the informality of labor markets there, meaning that people have really no social support once um, once there's a lockdown. And, you know, and so I just, you know, there's the, it's a very constrained situation in Latin America and, and what the possibilities would be as left wing governments hopefully come back to power. So Recently in Bolivia, uh, the left won, um, MAS won. That's very exciting. But their fiscal room to maneuver is very constrained by A, debt, and B, um, really low commodity prices for some of their exports. And so I think we need to just think about how the global political economy um, affects what the global South countries are able to do in terms of um, transition and then how we can you know, align our movements in the global north with pressing for changes at, at the, the scale of, of where the problem is. Um, and I'll just leave it there. That's a great answer. Thanks so much, Thea. Um, we had a few more questions lined up, but you all have such great questions coming in um, from the audience that we're actually just going to cut our questions short and jump straight into yours. Um, please keep them coming. Um, and again, we're trying to, to focus um, sort of international scenarios. So we're going to prioritize those. And the first one I have uh, for the panelists is from Les Lebedo. Um It's a question to all of the speakers. And it is, by contrast with green false techno solutions, how can dominant countries transform their economies to reduce dependence on resource extraction from the global south? And what kind of coalition could overcome the political obstacles, including those within the labor movement? Um, and I'm going to post that question in the chat. Um, does anyone want to take a stab at that one first? Yeah, I have a few things to say about that. Go for it, Max. Yeah. So uh, in terms of technological transitions, I think there is a beautiful resource that uh, the left needs to recover, which is that during the, 18, the 1980s, there was an incredible debate about appropriate technology, um, uh, which was thinking about technologies that were appropriate for uh, human scale development. And uh, this was... E.F. Schumacher, this was to some extent Paul Goodman, um, and but really there was actually a, a very developed array of actual concrete proposals put forward uh, for thinking about what, what was then called endogenous or auto-centered development, which is actually what we would, what is more familiarly known as local economies, and thinking about situating economies locally so that they draw on the local resource base and also take care of that resource base. And uh, that caretaking is kind of built into the entire structure of uh, the local economy. And you can also find proposals like this coming from um, certain regions of rural Spain. You can find it from Appalachia. Um, you could think of uh, analogously, you can think about some of it coming from uh, Cuba or from some of the um, other indigenous proposals uh, like the Carrick plan. And I think that uh, there is an opportunity now with a lot of what's going on in terms of the kind of decentralized distribution of knowledge, uh, fabrication labs and so forth. It's clear that there's ways to decentralize uh, manufacturing and industrialization in ways that allow for decentralized manufacturing economies. So this is a kind of this is something people should look into and examine and just spend some time on Google and just Google appropriate technology if you don't know about it. And if you do know about it, like read that stuff again, because it's super interesting. And I think it's very, very, very relevant to our debates today about how to transform uh, local economies. I think uh, Science for the People is one of the few groups that I know of that is really uh, is natural scientists that have connected so closely with the eco-socialist cause. And I think that can be broadened out by thinking about connecting with people doing uh, ecological design, for example, and ecological architecture. So actually, there's tons and tons of architects and designers working on things like that. They're kind of, you, often they're outside of like what is normally thought of as left-wing circles, but they have a lot of proposals for what you can, for 
entirely transforming, for example, the construction industry and making it so that people are building beautiful houses using the local materials and it actually empowers local labor. It locks in the resource because it stays in the local economy. And this is a possible method for uh, small scale transformation, but that adds up in the US and that actually attacks extractivism um, or the actually extracting from the global south and extracts it at the root. So that's something I really would encourage people to check out. Yeah, thank you, Max. Um, our last or second to last um, teaching was actually on art and design. And we had comrades from the architecture lobby and other similar groups, uh, planners, architects, uh, weigh in on a People's Green New Deal. Um, but we could definitely do more international work around that. That's it's a really valuable point. Um, does anyone else want to answer that question that came from the audience? Yeah. Yeah. Gracias. Yeah, I think that we. I don't think we can say we have a solution for this. How we can transform economies to reduce dependence? We don't know. We know the direction, and Max was just pointing at this idea. The direction, I think, it's clear. We have all the empirical material we want to demonstrate that the solution has to do with decentralization, relocalization of of uh, productive change, radical democratization of, we know that. I mean, uh, that's where we have to go. But to that, there is not just one pathway. I think there are two complementary or two different strategies to follow. We have to destabilize existing regimes. I mean, go against established powers. So the old order has to be destroyed and eroded. At the same time, Thousands or hundreds or millions of alternatives has to be incentivated because we need all of them. We don't have a pathway. Nobody will find the solution. So we need, even if we know that agroecology is the solution, the way the agroecological principles will come into place will be very different in every single neighborhood or village or uh, region. So, again, we have uh, the direction, the centralization, relocalization of production, etc., and we have like two key strategies, the uh, stabilization of existing powers and creating the condition for thousands of initiatives to to grow. And like maybe it's a very gradualist uh, approach to revolution. And this is something that is not shared by everyone. But I think it's quite realistic in terms of what we can expect in the following uh, decades to happen if we want to support social transformation. Uh, thanks, Sergio. Anyone else before we move to another question from the audience? I just say something quick, which is, um, you know, something that, that, that underscores a little bit, I think, where Max was going, which is like just to say clearly that, you know, being materialists like means paying attention to the materials, right? Like to how like our our communities are constructed, to how our neighborhoods are constructed, to how we get from point A to point B, like all of that is a material relationship between humans, technology, nature, whatever it is. And all of the way that those relationships are ordered have very real implications for the quantity of material that is taken from the earth, right? And I think that there are absolutely technologies, if we use that term broadly, that actually reduce the material intensivity of our lives, right? And so I think that, you know, it's not about being pro-technology or anti-technology. Those are very reductive positions. And I love science for the people because it like explodes that binary. And it's like, what would a technology that is, you know, human scaled, as Max put it, that is liberatory, what would an indigenous technology look like? You know, like technology is just a way that that we relate, right, in, in a sense. And so there's all sorts of ways to to design our social worlds and and just to respond to something that's been coming up in the chat and and that relates directly to this question which is like you know I think we have an opportunity now to not, to sort of leave in the dustbin of history a car dependent culture personally like I, I think that we can use this moment of transformation of of an electrification of the transit system to not reproduce one of 
a technology that is quite violent. It kills people like it results in lots of death. It it like obliterates our relationship to landscape. I mean, there's all sorts of problems with cars. I don't need to get into them, which doesn't mean I'm like against electrifying transit. It just means that we don't need to use that particular technology. We can think about the, you know, the technology of mass transit or public transit or community forms of transit. We can think about the technology of cycling. We can think about the technology of walking. I mean, you know, there's all, so, so just to kind of be broad about wh what kind of transit system, because that's just what relates to my work. Like, do we want to create um, in, in this moment of, of changing, hopefully changing um, um, these systems and these technologies? Um, thanks. Thanks, Thea. Um, Okay, I saw that uh, Jenny wanted to speak and also Brian, so let's just do the whole round, and then we'll go to the second audience question. Okay, sure. Thank you, Lala. Um, so I guess building off of what everyone said already, it's like a matter of reimagining how we do things, and it's also important to remember that everything is connected, and so must be our solutions. Um, so as I explained a bit before, the U.S. military is a key contributor to climate change. So while having a 100 percent renewable grid and investing in public transportation and affordable housing, they're all important for us um, domestically. It's also important to understand that most of the U.S. budget goes to its military, um, which I already got into. Uh, and it, it's terrible because these wars are being fought over access to resources like fossil fuels, which then cause more climate change. And um, at the local level, you see like as above, so below, um, the same thing could be said about funding for police departments. So I think it's important to be vigilant when the state criminalizes demonstrators um, and to always like highlight that when it happens um because it's wrong and the and we should also be vigilant when u.s politicians try to manufacture consent for war um this includes the new cold war that's brewing against china i organized with the international coalition for human rights in the philippines ICHIRP, and uh the philippines is a former u.s colony and it gets a lot of its military aid from the u.s it sells its the U.S. sells their used fighter jets to the Philippines. So they make money selling their used goods to the Philippines. And it has military bases in the Philippines. And uh, the Philippines would be obligated to help fight the U.S. against China or anywhere else, um, for that matter, if and when the time comes. So there's this mutual exchange of knowledge, personnel, policy, technology, and counterinsurgency techniques between the U.S. and the Philippines. And it happens with like local police departments as well. The NYPD has helped train the Philippine National Police, for example. Um, and this brings me to the main point that I'm trying to get to, which is that the Philippines is one of the deadliest countries for land defenders. And um, like last year, it was the second most deadly. And the year before 2018, it was the top most deadly uh, country for land defenders. And with the anti-terror law um, in the Philippines, even speaking out against the government as a Filipino or a non-Filipino. So me saying, like, I don't like what the Philippine government is doing. Like, I can be targeted as a terrorist for saying this. Um, so we need to show solidarity with other countries like the Philippines um, that are um, to this day, negatively impacted by U.S. imperialism. We have to challenge that and we have to be vigilant about U.S. foreign policy. Um, and in doing so, we could then free up all the money that is spent on the military and that could then be used for things that sustain life, like the Green New Deal. Yeah, exactly, Jenny. There is no eco-socialism without uh, anti-militarism and abolitionism, um, which in turn then has to be international. So thank you for those, for linking all those dots. Uh, Brian, take it away. I'll be real quick. Uh, the one, I, every, everyone's comments, I totally agree with, I think uh, are, are um, excellent points, um, is uh, I want to make the point around caretaking, like of, of the land. Um, so uh, that's not just here with indigenous people in North America, but throughout the Americas and throughout the world. And like how, and connect that to like social reproduction, right? So m most caretakers and caregivers of the land often are uh, indigenous women women um, uh, um, around the world. And actually, w w when we're talking about that, like 
thinking about how the 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 Green New Deal or um, the Global North needs to pay people <laughs> that do that, right? That's unpaid labor that um, is is uh, uh, that's the lifeblood uh, for our planet. And um, and so if we're serious about decolonization, if we're serious about a Green New Deal, um, we need to actually listen to those caretakers who you know have been you know taking care of the land for um, centuries um, and has been passed down uh, uh, from time to time and, and, and also is envisioning new technology at the same time, you know, not to, not making it static in, in the past, but like making that a central feature of actual funding, like taking what Jenny said, taking the money that is used for a, a um, an imperialist army around the world um, and actually gearing it towards those caretakers, I think is, would be needs to be key to thinking about that as well okay thank you brian um so this is the problem that we get when we have a brilliant audience and brilliant panelists we just run out of time because there's a lot to say on each issue um and just consider this teaching a a first step or you know a step in what is already a larger conversation including and beyond science for the people um because it's uh, wrap up time, I'm just going to ask our panelists to uh, give some final remarks, keep them brief, um, just one to two minutes. And if you could, uh, we had a lot of questions come in about how to get involved, what it looks like to get involved in an internationalist, um, eco-socialist uh, work. So if you could just speak to that specifically, um, that would be great. And we can follow the initial order that we had. So, Max, if you want to kick us off, please. Yeah, sure. So uh, I would just uh, rehearse my earlier point, essentially, which is that I think it is very easy and legitimate in its own way that uh, we focus when we're what we're looking domestically and we're focusing on uh, ecological and eco-socialist transformation. And we want to support people. Who who are trying to do that work. We're trying to do that work. We get involved in local campaigns. Um, and I think it's very important to keep in mind that there are our comrades whose voices uh, cannot always carry into campaigns which are cited in the North, right? Um, and the demands are there, but the problem is those demands are not, um, you know, they, they can't be shouting into silence. They need to be shouting into attentive ears, and it's our job to, to act upon them. And and think about what is the transformative obligation that falls upon us when certain demands are issued from the South for, uh, as they said, debt cancellations, and as Bolivia and other countries have been demanding for uh, ecological and climate debt uh, repayments. And so I really think, and thinking about where we are and how we can act in order to uh, arrive at a convergence and uh, unity in our diversity of locations, but really to begin where we are and uh, keep that in mind as we go forward and try to get to a better place. Excellent. Thanks so much, Max. Um, uh, next is Brian. Awesome. I'll try to be uh, quick. So, um, I guess a couple things of ways to get kind of get involved and think through is first off, you know, um, I think it's really important for anyone on this um, on this webinar to really consider a, about the indigenous struggle that is happening on where you are right now, because I actually think digging into that and making connections with um, the indigenous nations uh, land and people that um, um, live near you um, actually helps deconstruct those colonial borders that we have been, you know, uh, we all think of, right? And that helps, I think, with an international vision, right? To think beyond what we think uh, are the borders that exist. Um, um, I will say, I, I think that like doing that is really important. And obviously I mentioned, I'm a member of the Red Nation. I encourage folks to check out the Red Nation, uh, check out the Red Deal, um, I, and um, uh, we have some great media stuff, the, the Red Nation podcast, Red Power Hour, and really uh, try to um, it, to help 
no, I, I really do think the indigenous struggle in on Turtle Island can help really deconstruct and help us look with an international perspective. And I just really appreciate everyone uh, attending and appreciate all the panelists here. Um, this was really energizing. Thanks, Brian. Thea? Um, just want to reiterate where Brian left off. Thanks so much, uh, for everyone attending. And I've been sort of also on the chat and just the convert, the, you know, so much conversation and, and so rich and we could have gone on much longer, but you know, here we are. We have other things to do probably. So, um, so just, a, this has all been a pleasure. Um, I will just say that, you know, I, I don't think that change ever happens by individual action. It happens by collective action, right? So I think like the first thing to do is to, you know, join with existing movements. Um, Brian has, you know, already already mentioned some movements. Max has referred to them, and also think about those relationships between those movements and um, and the global south. And so we already kind of have that on the table. I'll just say what I'm involved in, and I encourage other folks to get involved in. I I just put it in the chat. Um, I'm involved in the Eco Socialist Working Group of DSA. I think that we've really been at the forefront, both of DSA and in in the the broader like socialist left of like thinking through what eco socialism might look like, what whatever revived internationalism might look like, and we work very closely with our comrades in the internationalist committee in DSA. That some of whom are are in this audience right now. We have some upcoming events um, that we're in the midst of planning, actually, with Brian on on thinking about an event that combines the Red Deal and the Green New Deal and puts them into conversation with one another. We're also supporting the international committee's event on indigenous struggles that's forthcoming so we're trying to do that work you know we're not perfect it's a road and we're trying to you know walk you know make the road by walking it but you know the more folks that are involved from the more different perspectives i think you know the better um and and um yeah i'll just i'll just leave it there um thanks so much for the organizers and then the translators again jenny um, first, I'd like to thank you all for the opportunity to speak here today, and thank you for everyone who's watching. Um, yeah, just to echo some of the stuff that we discussed, it's super important to be internationalist in any um, proposal for change. And in order to have an internationalist perspective, it's important to remember that um, because everything is connected, the the local is also like it also has planetary implications and also the other way around planetary like a war happening on the other side of the world also affects our ability to um, enact a Green New Deal here. So it's important to understand that connection and to remember um, that um, anything put in place by humans can be challenged by humans um, and we're yeah, you know, we're all individually powerful, but we're more powerful if we stand together. And um, on that note, I organize with Solidarity and Mutual Aid Jersey City, and it's super important to remember that what we are fighting for is each other and um, standing up for your loved ones and friends in your communities, protecting them, um, uh, opposing the police and um, calling attention to how unjust incarceration in general is, but also um, like ICE detention centers, like all of these things are connected there and they will become the networks that we create now will become even more important um, as time goes on. Um, and yeah, so that's important is to remember that everything starts locally and you need to stand up for your neighbors. Um, because doing so can also support people far away from where you are. Oh, yeah, Jenny. All right, thank you. And just with a bang. Gracias, Lala. Very briefly. Well, first of all, thanks so much. I am so grateful for this very energizing, inspiring, interesting conversation. It was really amazing. Thank you so much to organizers. Very briefly, I would say that engaging uh, in, an internationalist uh, Green New Deal is easy. It is just about engaging in any local transformatory initiative we can find around the corner. I think they are all internationalist per se, considering their goals. So supporting our ecological farming around the corner, taking part in, I don't know, 
in, in the alternative housing movement, uh, using social currency, anything is good for international transformation from this green new deal perspective. So it is easy. In any case, there are some big, 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 big challenges for international uh, green new deal. And you mentioned a lot of them, how to manage the diversity of local solutions, how to connect or ma make uh, coexist different agendas, which are not always fully compatible, as Pia mentioned for the case of uh, Chile. How we can do things quickly, why times for organize, organizing internationally are so long. Uh, how we connect all these discourses and proposals with uh, normal people who are experiencing these possessions and who are very fear, to a lot of fear. Uh, they have a lot of hope, but they have a lot of fear. So how are we dealing with the situation? So I think we have the, all the elements for doing that. We have the ideas, we have the discourses, we have the alternatives. We know that they work, but how are we going to connect all them and to, to keep on with this transformative path. Gracias, Sergio. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you to the panelists. This was the closing teaching of a seven-part series, an enormous effort from the People's Green New Deal Editorial Collective of Science for the People magazine. Uh, please check the link chat, the chat links for how to get involved with Science for the People. Um, we know that technology and science is not neutral. We know that it is latent with political uh, ideology, that it is a tool used by and for some people, some ends, and that it is ours to take back, take control of, and use as a tool for freedom around the globe. Thank you for uh, tuning in, and we will be sending the um, transcript of the chat via email. Um, take care, everyone. Let's Let's win this world. Thanks. So much. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Panelists, don't, don't, don't leave. Panelists, I, stay. Oh, okay, sure. <laughs>